in the sutta we chanted just now. The Buddha teaches not self to a group of monks who are on the verge of becoming arahants. But it's not a teaching just for people on the verge of awakening. When he taught his son meditation, even before he taught him breath meditation, he taught him the perception of not self. Right at the very beginning, when you sit down, even before you look at the breath, think about not self. The teaching is used in different ways at those different parts of the path. If you're on the verge of becoming an arahant, your, your main duty is to let go of everything, anything that you might identify with in any way at all. That's the last step. But at the beginning, you use it to disidentify with things that are not useful to identify with. And we have a lot of them. Even before we let go of everything, there are a lot of things we should let go strategically. There are other things you want to hold on to. After all, the path is both letting go and developing. And it's the developing we have to hold on to. And it's good to notice what that perception of not-self is, so you can use it properly in both stages. The Buddha is not saying that there is no self. He's simply saying that when you identify, this is me, this is myself, this is what I am, the things that are going to cause suffering, it's not really worth, worth it. That's the conclusion that he has, the, the monk's draw. Not that there is no self, but simply that things that are inconstant and they're stressful, then why lay claim to them? We lay claim to them because we don't have anything better, or at least we don't think we have anything better. And at that point, at the end of the path, there's nothing that would require you to hold on. But to get to that point, there are other things we do have to develop that we do have to hold on to. Notice that it's not only there are things that you should not identify as self, but not even identify as this is me or this is what I am. Many times you have people say that, well, the Buddha taught there is no self, but then they go to answer, well, what are you? The traditional answer was that a lot of the commentators came up with was the five aggregates, which is precisely what the Buddha is saying is not you. This gets back to that old point where he says, if you ask the question, what am I, you get entangled in a thicket of views. It's either do I exist, do I not exist, I have a self, I don't have a self. However you express it. it it's not a technical point of language, it's just a simple fact of clinging, clinging to things that cause suffering. So even the question, what are you, or what is the Buddha's idea of what a person is, gets put aside. But at the same time, he does say you need a sense of self. He talks about the self as a governing principle. Which you think about how other people can follow the path, they're human beings, you're a human being. They can do it, why can't you? That's something you actually need on the path to keep you going. There's also the point where he says, you think about, I started this practice because I wanted to put an end to suffering. And if I abandon the practice, I'm going to go back to where I was before, and probably, or maybe even worse. The implication being, do you really love yourself? If you loved yourself, you wouldn't give up on the path. Even when he talks about the reason for why you would apply not-self to something that you've been holding on to is it's, it's for your long-term welfare and happiness. The you in there implies, okay, that's part of your motivation. So don't be too quick to let go of things that are actually useful. And when the Buddha does talk about having a sense of yourself, it's not identifying yourself with your race or your gender or your body or a lot of the things that we tend to identify ourselves with. It's more taking stock of where you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are. There are six qualities in all that he talks about. One is conviction, the next is virtue, learning. Generosity, discernment, quick-wittedness. 
These are all skills we can develop. And you want to have a sense of where you are, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, so you can use your strengths to make up for your weaknesses. How is your conviction? Are you really convinced that you can follow this path? Are you really convinced that the Buddha knew what he was talking about? We're all going to have doubts. As the Buddha said, you, you don't get past doubt until stream entry, at the point where your conviction gets confirmed. But in the meantime, you've learned how to encourage yourself, because it is a reasonable path. The teaching is a very reasonable teaching. And it's a path that asks only good things of you. There's nothing that you have to do that's going to be underhanded or low or something you'd be ashamed of afterwards. It's all noble. So learn how to strengthen your conviction if you find that it's weak. Look at your virtue. How are you in the way you act and speak? What are the aspects of speech that you need to work on? This is directly related to the meditation. Because the way you talk to others is the way you talk to your mind. The way you talk to your own mind is the way you talk to others. They go back and forth. And for a lot of us, there's a very little filter on our speech. So things that come into the mind go out the mouth right away. You've got to work on that filter. There's a passage where the Buddha says, you know, we're born with an axe in our mouths, the tongue. And we can use it to harm other people, we can use it to harm ourselves if we're not careful. At the same time, however, an axe, when you learn how to use it properly, is very useful. So have some respect for all the effort that went into becoming a human being and having a human mouth. Learn to use your mouth well. Be careful with your speech, because that translates into direct a thought and evaluation. Even before you're going to speak, you have to direct your thoughts to things and evaluate them, and then you come up with something to say. Now, all too often we don't put too much energy into evaluating things, because whatever pops into our minds, whatever comment we make, that's the evaluation right there, and it comes right out. But if you're more careful about how you evaluate things, what should be said, what shouldn't be said, how to say things, then when the time comes to sit down and meditate, you'll have that skill inside. You can talk to yourself in ways that actually improve your meditation, that direct you in useful directions to useful topics, useful issues. And you learn how to evaluate, evaluate what's going on in your mind and in your body with some finesse. And John Lee's analogy is that it's like sifting flour. If you have a very loose weave, you get coarse flour. If you have a fine weave, you get fine flour, and the, the price of the flour goes up, and the uses you can have for it get better and better. So have a fine weave in your filter, both when you speak to other people and when you speak to yourself about the breath, speak to yourself about the body and the mind in the present moment. Bring some refinement to your analysis, and you'll find that by paying attention to this, you get better and better results. Learning. Learning here doesn't apply to your learning in school. It applies to your learning in the Dharma. You know, the Buddha didn't say that he had soul right on what counts as, and doesn't count as Dharma. I mean, there are things we've learned from our parents, things we've learned from people around us that really are useful in training the mind. But it's good to check them against what the Buddha had to say, to see how they fit in with his principles. Read the Dharma, think about it, enough so that you have a fund. You, know, you hear many times the Forest of John saying, put your studies aside and just focus on what you're doing. Well, what you're doing is going to be guided by what you learned in the past. And sometimes as an issue comes up in the meditation, you'll be able to remember, oh, there's this passage where the Buddha said this, or there's another one where he said that, or the Ajahn said this. That too will help you in your meditation. So have a good fund. Generosity. 
as some Buddha once said, the path is one thing clear through. It starts with generosity and ends with generosity. In other words, you're giving up things. But you're giving up things in a way that's actually helpful to yourself and the people around you. You don't just throw things away. You think about, what do I have that I don't need but other people could use well? You think about their needs. It opens your mind and makes it broader. So it's not just me, 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 and the drama of me all the time. It's you as a citizen of the world, you as a helpmate for the people around you. And again, when you have this habit of being generous, and this is not only with things, but also with your time, with your forgiveness, with your energy, sharing your knowledge in a way that's actually helpful to other people. You bring a better mind to the meditation. And you also bring the attitude, what can I give to the meditation? You're going to have to give some energy. You're going to have to give some time. You're going to have to give a lot of attention to what you're doing. And finally, there's discernment. This is directly related to the practice of concentration, to get the mind to settle down so it's not wandering around as it always likes. You've got to figure out, what can I do to interest it in the present moment? What can I do to cut away its interest in things outside? All those ongoing conversations you've had with other people. How can you pull out, at least for the time of the meditation? You'll ask yourself, well, what, what are the hooks? Look for those hooks. Did you see the hooks? Well, one of the best things is just sit down and do the meditation and see what pulls you out. Without the concentration, you can't see these things. You can read about them and have some general ideas. But the general ideas are not going to pry you loose of your defilements. It's when you actually see a defilement in action. So, oh, this is what's my mind. <clears throat> this is what my mind is doing to me. And I can see myself suffering. This is where quick-wittedness comes in to help the discernment. What else could you do? Because not everything is written down in the books. Not everything is taught to you in Dharma talks. You've got to figure out how to take the basic principles and use them, apply them to yourself. And sometimes that requires cooking up new strategies. So this is where it's good to have a sense of yourself, where your weak points are. When you sit down to meditate and things are not going well, just take stock. Is your conviction strong enough? Is your, your virtue, your learning, your generosity, your discernment, your quick-wittedness? Which of these factors requires working on? Because all this comes into that, the duty to develop before you let go. So this is where having a sense of yourself is very important. Notice you're not defining who you are. You're just looking at what are the talents and what are the skills I have at hand. So I can actually master this path. And what are the things that are getting in the way? Those are the things that you apply the perception of not self to. And it's easier to apply that perception and have it work when you have a other things that you can identify with that are actually skillful. You can't create a skillful sense of self if there are no skills to back it up, because it's just empty and you start thinking that you're lying to yourself. But if you actually have some skills, you find that you can focus on the breath and you're better at it than today than you were yesterday. Or you find it easier to hold your tongue when you might have said something that was hurtful or harmful. That's all to the good. You can see oh, I'm making progress. And you can encourage yourself. You've got a new self, a new me. In the beginning, it's just one more me and a, stable, a large stable of me's. 
But as you strengthen it, it can actually start evicting the ones that are really harmful. And then when the me as the meditator has done all its work, okay, that's when you apply that self to everything. But in the meantime, strengthen it. Have a good, strong sense of what skills it has and what new skills it needs to develop in order to get the job done. That's how you use the teaching of not-self in a skillful way. As the Buddha pointed out, there are a lot of things you have to hold on to in his teachings. But some of the teachings are like snakes. You have to grab them right in order to get the most use of them. If you grab them wrong, they can actually do you harm. The teaching of not-self is one of those. If you grab it right at the tail, where it's where the idea that there is no self, you can do an awful lot of harm to yourself. If there is no self, then what, what does anything matter? There's nobody there. Then who's getting harmed? Who's getting? Who's suffering? Who's doing the path? And that can just that kind of thinking can short circuit everything. Or if they hold the snake right next to the neck, and then you can get the venom you want out of the snake, and then you can use it as an antidote. That's what it means to grasp the teachings properly and to actually to use them skillfully. In this case, you use the teaching on not self to learn how to disidentify with things that are actually causing you harm, that you may have liked, or it's just simply hung on to because you didn't see you had anything better. Well, now you use these new skills to develop a new sense of self that provides you with a fulcrum that you can pry your attachments away to those other things. And then when the work is done, you can let everything go. It's like finishing the job. You've worked on a piece of furniture, you can put down your hammer and sauce. You've Finish the dish that you are making. Okay, you can put down the pan, you can put down the spoons and other utensils. And enjoy the results of the work you've done. 